טוב, שלום לכולם, אני שמח לארח את אמיר יודאיוף. אני אקריא את זה באנגלית. אמיר הסיב את ה-PGD from the Weizmann Institute of Science and was a two-year member at the Institute for Advanced Study. Hello. So currently, Amir Yudayev uh, is a current professor, currently a professor in the Department of Mathematics uh, at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. Uh, his main research area is theoretical computer science, uh, and he wrote a book on com uh, communication complexity and its application. And today, he will give us a talk about the uh, characterization of multi-class variability. So, Amir, thank you for being here. זה, קודם כל, לא הייתי פה המון זמן, וזה תמיד מרגש אותי להסתובב שם למעלה, איפה שגם אני למדתי. טוב, אז זה, זה, אני אספר לכם על שיחה מאוד ארוכה עם נטלי ברוכים, שהיא סטודנטית בפרינסטון. דניאל קרמון שלומד בטכניון, עירי דינור מוויצמן ושי מהטכניון. לא שידוע לי, אבל... טוב, אז הכוונה שלי זה לא להיות ב... בחלקים מאוד מאוד טכניים וכאלה חישוביים. אלא להסביר את הרעיונות. אני אשמח לקבל כל פידבק, כל שאלה, כל מחשבה. אוקיי, אז ההתחלה היא מאוד מאוד רחבה, מאוד... כן, אז ההתחלה של הסיפור זה, זה שאלה מאוד פשוטה. זה מתי אפשר ללמוד, זו השאלה שמנחה את ה... את ה... עברית? אינגליש. אינגליש, גוד, כן. And we are going to try to answer a very, very specific instance of this big question. Um, so the first part uh, will be just to define this question, to say what I mean from a mathematical perspective. Um, and I, I guess you all know this, but I'm not sure, so I will go over it anyhow. Um, So we are going to define the term learning and the term possible. This is the two things we want to define. Um, and the, the model we are going to, to use as a learning model is the PAC model. Um, and the basic question in the PAC model is what is the amount of samples, the amount of data we need to get in order to make accurate predictions? This is the... a basic thing the model tries to capture. Um, so this is a, a very s simple example, and it's the purpose is to introduce notation. So the input is a sequence of labeled data. In our case, it will be uh, every input uh, sample is a point x, y. x is in some domain. And y is a bit in this case. And the goal is to make accurate predictions on unseen data. This is the uh, 
the story we, we want to capture. And the way we model it is like this. So we get a sample S. The sample S consists of N independent samples from some distribution D. And the distribution D is not known. We don't know it. Is it OK? This is very elementary. Um, then the output should be a classification of all the data. So it's a function from x to bits to 0, 1, which should be the, uh, the function we are trying to learn somehow. And the goal is to have as small error as possible. So the error is measured in this talk. Uh, using the 0, 1 loss. So we want to make accurate predictions uh, in, in, in the sense that they are equal to, uh, to what the distribution tells us. So this is the error of what we output. Does, does this make sense? Yes? OK. And now we need to say what does small mean and what does high probability mean. So we, these are the choices we are going to make here. So high probability will be 99%. And small is a bit more uh, complicated. So the way we are going to measure small is with respect to some uh, collections of, collection of functions H, which is typically called the hypothesis class. And the way we can think about this H is in two ways. H can be thought of as the collection of functions we are going to use as an algorithm designer. Or we can think about it as the class of functions we want to compete with uh, if we want to choose a different collection of functions. Uh, we are, in this talk, we are going to uh, think about H as a collection of functions we are going to compete with. And then the goal is to output with 99% probability a function f whose error is slightly more than uh, the best function in the class. OK? Yes? Is there a specific reason that you're fixing the concept? You don't want to know like, the dependence on the probability of the uh, um, the, the reason I'm doing this is that the expressions are simpler. There is nothing surprising going on here. Nothing is uh, tricky or surprising. Uh, okay, so th this is the model. Uh, we get a finite amount of data from an unknown distribution, IID. We want to output a classification on all the data, and this is the goal, what we want to achieve. Um, Okay, and the question, now this is a, mo a mathematical question, uh, for which classes H, the previous problem can be solved with the finite N? This is a, a, a way to formalize the question. Can we learn this compared to this concept class? Okay. okay. And... Uh, this question was studied uh, from the, it depends how you count, maybe 60s, 80s, something like that. Um, and the, the basic theorem in this context is that this problem can be solved if and only if the VC dimension of this concept class is finite. Um, the important thing is that right now, we, I guess, do you know, everybody knows what is VC dimension? Mm -hmm. so, okay. so I will, t I will ex define it later, but for now it's important. The only thing is that we need to know it's a, a number or infinity, and it depends only on the concept graph. This is for now the only thing we need to know. Uh, so this theorem answers the question for which classes H can we learn the, in, a, in a very, very specific model of learning. Um, and the ideas behind this proof or 
this theorem leads to other conclusions, algorithmic, for example, the proof shows that in this scenario, every algorithm that minimizes the empirical loss performs pack learning, achieves this goal. Um, a different type of algorithmic conclusion is a very abstract algorithm, which is called the one inclusion graph algorithm. Um, do you know the one inclusion graph algorithm? Uh, it, so I, I will not define it, but it's a, a in somewhat similar to the nearest neighbor algorithm, but it's more abstract in, in my mind. So it's a very nice algorithm. Uh, so these are sort of algorithmic conclusions. A different way to think about it is that if in some case we know that the VC dimension is high, then we, we, maybe we should do some other thing. We should make a different choice. Um, and there, there is a lot of a lot more information behind this theorem. And there are also, um, how is it, how do you say it? Bicoret, how do you say it? Like, criticism about this model. Uh, it's not the best model, maybe even today. Uh, it's not even a good model, uh, but this is a, the basic model that the whole story start with, started with, I think. Um, and mathematically, it's very rich. Uh, so this is about this model. And uh, what we are trying to do now is extend this model to a more general framework of multi-class learning. In multi-class learning, we, do, we don't just want to output a single bit, zero or one. We want to output some other thing. So for example, it could be what animals appear in a picture, or uh, from some uh, data like this uh, to decide how, how does the protein will look like in three dimensions. Um, so this is protein <laughs> folding and many other scenarios where we don't want just a single bit, we want to output something more, in, uh, more informative. Uh, and th this setting is called the multi-class setting. And th it's the same definition as we saw before, exactly the same, except that the output is not just 0, 1, but some arbitrary set y. OK? So it's the same thing, except that instead of bits, we output some other thing. Does it make sense? Why the finite? No, so y is abstract. There is finite, infinite. Yeah. Okay. And this scenario was studied uh, again starting in the late 80s, maybe. And the, the first result, I think, in this context is a similar theorem to what we saw before. Uh, when the set is finite, when we know its size, then there is a way to characterize learnability, and this is via the Natarajan dimension. Do you know what is the Natarajan dimension? Uh, yeah, maybe it's a 30% yes, something like that. Um, I didn't know what is the Natarajan dimension before also. So. Uh, but I will tell you later what is the Natarajan dimension. So this, this, was a, this is an extension of the previous theorem. Um, and the thing that was left <coughs> unclear, uh, ah, OK, so before. So he, here is a specific dimension, the Natarajan dimension. But it turns out that in the multi-class setting, when, when y is not just 0 and 1, it's, say, of size 3 or size 20 or infinite. Uh, there are a few ways to extend the VC dimension. Uh, so the Natarajan dimension is one way. A different way is called the graph dimension. A different way is called the fat shattering dimension, pseudo dimension, and many other dimensions can be defined in this context. Uh, there is a, this paper, I think, studies what can 
what can all dimensions be, like a very general framework of what can a dimension even be like. And in, for, in our case, most importantly, will be this specific dimension uh, defined by uh, Amit and Shai, uh, which I will t talk about later. Okay. So in this multi-class setting, it's not even clear what is the dimension that should come from the theory. And the reason uh, I'm giving this talk is that there was one part of the theory that was not complete is that the number of samples this theorem gives us in order to make to achieve pack learning depends on the size of y. So if y is infinite, for example, this th the previous theorem was completely meaningless. There was no, no way to understand what is going on. Um, and even fr from an algorithmic perspective, there was no algorithm that was, even if it's not efficient, but at least it achieves the best sample complexity possible. We didn't have such an algorithm. Um, okay, so th this was the sort of the, the gap in the theory. And the first thing we, uh, we prove is that the dimension defined by uh, Amit and Shai, which we call the DS dimension, um, characterize learnability exactly. This is the first, uh, first theorem. So the, the DS dimension is the correct extension of the VC dimension in this context. And here we also have some algorithmic conclusions. Uh, I will explain to you how this algorithm leads to a framework of least learning. Instead of learning one thing, we sort of output a list. And there is a way to use the one inclusion graph algorithm, which I mentioned before, in a more uh, elaborate way, maybe. Uh, from the other perspective, this was also already proved, was known, that this dimension it provides a lower bound on the sample complexity. So there are the same, uh, this is similar to the VC dimension. Um, maybe, do, do you want to <laughs> say something about I don't know. Uh, no. Okay. Okay, so these are, this is a, in analogy to the previous result. So this is one result. Uh, the second result uh, is that, so, uh, finding the correct dimension was sort of uh, uh, people search for the correct dimension and the only dimension that was sort of uh, left as unknown is this Natarajan dimension this was from the 80s and nobody knew if this is a good dimension or not so uh, um, and Part of this, a, a very different part of this work, is that this dimension does not characterize learnability. And there is a very nice story here. I will tell you the story. So the, there are two results. One is that the DS dimension is good. The second result is the Natarajan dimension is not good in the sense of characterizing learnability. So th this is the end of the story in the beginning. Do you want to ask something, say something? This thing about regression, because I saw you, you said that why is arbitrary? Uh, no, the, this is about the 0-1 loss. Regression is a different, uh, different. I'm not, so I will show you the construction. I don't think it can be, it's a very non-Euclidean scenario, this thing. Okay, so. Now I want to first define some, di explain a few things about dimensions in general and define the three dimensions, the VC, the Natarajan and DS dimensions. This is the, wh what I want to do now. So at least we know all the definitions. And then I, would, I want to explain to you a few ideas, just very high level ideas that I find nice. Okay, and are, so are somehow related to 
Mm, okay. So a dimension a dimension in this context is a way to take a problem and map it into integers or infinity. So we want to assign a problem some number. And then this number should cap capture the complexity of the problem in some sense. Okay, so if the number is large, the problem is hard. If the number is small, the problem is easy. And there are many reasons to try to build, uh, to find such a, a device. Um, and from a, a, a theoretical perspective, it helps us to understand things. And maybe for a more practical perspective, it can guide our choices when we choose things in, in, when we design algorithms. So this is the very high level goal. Um, and the very high level method to construct a dimension is something like this. So the way we formulate, uh, we formalize the term learning problem is by this concept class, H. This is the, the interpretation, the mathematical definition of a learning problem. Uh, then, so this is uh, idea one. Idea two is to look on, so we, uh, the notion of shattering. The notion of shattering is like this. We can look on uh, local parts of the set X. So we choose some subset S of the, the big set X, and then we can project all of these functions H to this uh, local view. Um, and we say that a set, a specific part of the universe is shattered if this collection of functions is complex. And we need to define what complex means, but this is the intuition. So if the projection is complicated, then it is shattered. And then the dimension is defined as the maximum size of a shattered set. So we look on all local views, which look on the maximal one that is shattered, and this is the dimension. So it's a very general mechanism to define dimension to a learning problem. And the only thing we need to choose is the notion of complex. How do we measure complexity? Does this make sense? Okay. Uh, so I, now we will define three dimensions. The first is VC dimension. Uh, in the VC setting, the a set is complex, is shattered, if when we project, project all the functions to this part, we get all the functions that are defined over this set. So we get, in this local view, we get everything. This is the notion of complex for the VC dimension. And it was defined uh, in the 60s. Mm. Okay. Now we want to extend this to the multiclass setting. Then we don't have 0, 1 anymore. We have some Y. This is the... So the first definition uh, <coughs> is the Natarajan dimension. And instead of, na so again, we just need to define what does shattered mean. So shattered for the Natarajan dimension means that this collection of functions, it's a function from S to Y, Y is some arbitrary uh, set. So this collection of functions contains a copy of this collection of functions. So just really a, a copy. Now, y is the, may not even contain the symbol 0 or 1. So it doesn't make sense as is. So here is what does contain mean. It means that there is a way to assign to each value in s some uh, value in y. So in the in some x in s, we have f of x and g of x. This is like the 0, 1 values for s, some other 0, 1 values, some other 0, 1 value. And then uh, 
a collection of functions is a copy of the cube if it's a copy where we replace zero by f of x and one by g of x. Okay, so. Is this equivalent to defining a function from y to zero one and s and, and now let's put y to z and and then say that it's um, uh, the v, that it's the VC dimension of, of the hypothesis class to z or is um, the, so here the function is also the, the function you're talking about may also be defined locally. So I think it is, but it's not a tautology. You need to verify something. But it's very similar to, <laughs> it's very similar to what you said. Um, Can I ask a question? Sure. I just want to make sure I understood. Mm -hmm. You're basically saying you're defining, uh, you're taking for uh, uh, f and g uh, such that for every point, so for, for every data point, uh, you're, you're labeling it as zero or one No, so this is a, this is a collection of functions from S to Y. Now, this collection of functions will contain a copy of the cube. This, what does it mean to contain a copy of the cube? Maybe. No. So we could have, so the, let's say that Y one, two, three, four. This is one. So containing a copy is something like we have one, two in the coordinate one times three, four in coordinate two, which means we have the four functions. One, three, one, four, two, three, two, four. This, this means this is four functions from a set of size two to y. Yeah, th this is like x1 is mapped to this, x2 is mapped to this. And if the collection of functions uh, h restricted to s contains these four functions, then we say it is shattered. And these four functions are, co correspond to the Boolean cube. So this is like, Zero, one, zero. Sorry, one, 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 zero. Yeah, the, the, this is so. Okay, does it make sense? Yeah. Maybe you could give it an example of a set that is Natarajan's shatter, but not this is shatter, or vice versa. A little bit of this. So, the VC dimension is not defined for general Y. There is just, oh, okay. it, it doesn't compile. There is, it's, okay. uh, and we can choose how to define an analogy of the VC dimension. One analogy is this analogy. So maybe a stronger analogy, uh, a stronger notion of shattering will be uh, this thing. This is a, a very strong notion of shattering, uh, but th this is uh, very, very strong. Th this is too strong. A slightly weaker is this definition. So it's not all the functions, but it is something like 0, 1 to the s, except that this, this does not make sense. It, do it doesn't make sense. So we, when we try to make sense of it, this is what we get. Oh, okay. Inside. Yeah, you sort of embed the Boolean cube in a, inside. Okay, so this was defined by Natarajan, and it's called the Natarajan dimension. Um, so th this is a, a second dimension. And the third dimension is the, the dimension which is most important. And the issue here is how to define what is the Boolean cube in a way, but not in a Boolean setting, but in an abstract setting. So here is uh, the way I, uh, it's not exactly the same language that was used, but this is equivalent. So now instead of containing uh, the Boolean cube as embedded, 
we want to, compare, uh, to contain something that we call a pseudo-cube. What is a pseudo-cube? A pseudo-cube is a collection of functions, and this collection should be finite and non-empty. It's important that it's finite. And what properties does it have? If we look on a function in this collection and some coordinate inside the set we care about, then there is some other function g that differs from the function f on this entry i. So for every function, there is a neighbor in the i-th direction. Yeah? A neighbor in the sense that of a humming, uh, humming distance one. So this is a different way to define the Boolean cube, not via all the function, but every vector has a neighbor. The, in the zero one setting, this is equivalent to the Boolean cube, but this is in the abstract setting, a different definition. Uh, so this, the maximum size of a shattered set in this sense is called the DS dimension. Does this make sense? Okay. Um, so this is like uh, 30 years after the previous <coughs> 25 years. Um, okay, and the... Here are some basic facts about this. In the Boolean case, all of them are the same. So this is a nice property. And in general, the, the VC dimension is not defined, so we can't compare. But the other two dimensions are the same up to uh, the size of the, the number of labels. OK, so this thing uh, is. Uh, easy because a Boolean cube is a pseudo cube. So th this is what is written here. This thing is not easy. Um, and in fact, it's quite confusing. There, there are subtleties there. Uh, but it, it is true. Um, so th these are the relations between these dimensions. Um, okay, some data about something. No. Okay, and he, here are the connection between the DS dimension uh, between these dimensions and learning in the multiclass setting. So Natarajan and uh, Tadepali proved that the Natarajan dimension is a lower bound on the sample complexity of learning. <coughs> this is uh, uh, 80s. Um, much later, uh, I get maybe this was one of the reasons for defining this dimension. I'm not sure we can, we can sh share the idea. But it was proved or shown that, that the DS dimension is the, serves as the same lower bound. And as we saw before here, the, the second statement is strictly stronger than the first statement. So this is strictly stronger than this. And what we add to the picture is an upper bound, which is the DS dimension to the power 1.5. This is the, uh, the other direction. And it's quite annoying that we can't get it to match this, but this is what we can do. Um, so this is the first part, the characterization of learnability. So our contribution is this upper bound. This was uh, already known. Um, so this is the connection to learning. And the refutation statement the, is uh, the existence of some specific concept class. There is a concept class whose Natarajan dimension is one and whose DS dimension is infinite. So it's not learnable, but the Natarajan dimension is one. This is the other part. And an analogy for this concept class from combinatorics 
uh, is something like this. Um, so in combinatorics, there are two, two basic notions. One is the uh, chromatic number of a graph. This is the least number of colors in a proper coloring. Do you know this, I guess? So I assume you know this. Otherwise, it's meaningless what I'm saying. And a different uh, notion is the girth. The girth is the minimum uh, length of a cycle. So if the girth is large, then locally the graph looks like a tree. And it is known, but not trivial, that there are graphs with large girth. So locally they look like trees, which means that they are too colorable. So every local view is easy, few colors, but globally they are hard. You need many colors globally. So this is an analogy for this type of statement. This is locally, everything is okay. Globally, it doesn't work, okay? So th this is a, yeah, the second statement. So now at least everything was defined. And now for the rest of the time, I want to tell you some ideas, okay? Unless you want to ask something. Okay. So uh, here is the one idea. This is basically the only idea I'm going to tell you about the algorithm. It's a very simple idea, but I think it's, it can be useful just this line of thought. So the first observation uh, is that if the DS dimension is finite, so what we want to do, we have a class of finite DS dimension, we want to learn it. Right? The, right? This is the goal. The first observation is that this data, if the DS dimension is finite, we, we have some slight advantage in predicting unseen data. Very, very slight advantage. We have a very, very weak layer. So this is a first observation, first idea. Now, in this abstract setting, the natural thing to do is to try to boost it somehow. We have a weak learner. We make it strong. There is boosting. It's, everything is good. But in this abstract set setting, boosting doesn't, it's not clear what, is, was it, what does it even mean. It doesn't work. So. Forget about boosting. Think about it much more simplistically. We have a weak learner, learner. We can think about it as producing a list. So what, what do we do? We take the weak learner. We run it once. We run it twice. We run it three times. We run it 100 times. In one of the times, it will be OK. So we produced a list of size 100 that contains the thing we want. So instead of a very weak learner, we got a least learner. So it's a very simple-minded operation. Yeah? Just, yeah. Each time it's on a different sample? sample? No, we have a x. We want to say what is f of x, yeah. y of x. We run the weak learner once, we get an answer. We ru run the weak learner again, we de get a different answer. It's a randomized algorithm. We run it again, we get a different answer. So we have some uh, list. And because we have a slight advantage, uh, with, in a finite amount of time, we will get the thing we need. This amount of ad advantage uh, corresponds to the least size. So this is idea two. Then we can. Uh, take this list learning and think about it differently. We can think about it as producing for every <coughs> sample an alpha, a, a, a list of alphabet samples that one of them is correct. So we can think about one and two as a way to reduce the alphabet size from, say, infinite to 10. Okay, so this is idea number three. And then when we reduce the alphabet size, we can sort of do things that are known. Okay, so this is the, the idea. Uh, it's very, very high level. 
I, I, don't, I didn't explain any detail, just the very high. Okay. So this is the outline of the algorithm. And now I want to uh, explain a, a different idea. And I want to uh, demonstrate what does the DS dimension do and how is it related to this slight advantage, okay, by an example. Um, so the example is from a learning game. It's a very simple learning game. Here is the game. We have some known graph. It's written on the board like this. And then somebody chooses a random edge in the graph, this edge. How does he choose or she chooses the edge? Uh, he chooses a vertex, let's say uniformly, let's say this vertex, and then chooses a random edge touching this vertex, one of these three edges. And then give us this edge. Okay. We get this edge, what do we need to do? We need to guess what is the vertex that was chosen. We don't see the vertex, we need to guess which of the two endpoints was chosen by the, this other person. So this is a learning game. Does it make sense? We sort of need to guess from which of the two endpoints the data the, the other person chose. And the DS dimension somehow captures this game. So here are two graphs. Uh, this graph is three regular. So what is the chance with, that we get the answer correctly here, intuitively at least? So we, uh, let's say we got this edge. What is the chance that we guess the co correct vertex? We have two options. So 50-50. Uh, 50-50. <laughs> so here we can't do anything non-trivial. It just everything is symmetric. There is no reason this one is better than this one. You output the edge, not the... We, we input, we, the input is the edge. We output one of the two okay. endpoints. So there are two options. So here it's 50-50. Here we can do something non-trivial. If we got this edge, it is more likely that this vertex was, uh, was the one than this vertex. So. In, in a tree, we have a slight advantage. Why is that? Though? Why is that? Because if this, person chose, if this person chose this vertex, it is twice more likely that the edges going down were chosen than the edge going up was chosen. But each of those vertices has a degree of three. So yeah, except the leaves. So if you're choosing the edge between two of the non-leaves, two of the inner nodes, mm -hmm. then each of them has a degree of three, so choosing that edge is just as likely for each of them, so what is the No, so if the person chose this vertex, mm -hmm. it is twice more likely that the edge he is going to choose is going down than up. Right. So if we saw this edge, it is likely that he chose this one. The edge is directed? So we imagine the, so oh. we imagine here that it's directed. So the, the point is that, so I, I, I'm not going to prove it formally, but. I just want to make sure, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm yeah. sorry. Just when you're choosing this, uh, the edge based on the vertex, mm -hmm. you're choosing only a directed edge from the vertex to another edge? We, we, we choose a yeah, vertex, yeah. so the edges are not directed, but we choose an edge touching the vertex. Right. So. If we saw this edge, it is more likely that it came from this one because the, the chance of an, an edge going down is twice more likely than an edge going up. So this is the reason, and you can do the calculation. I don't want to do it. This is intuition. So somehow the DS dimension here is full. The DS dimension here is not full. Okay, this is what the DS dimension does. It measures... Is the, in a, in a way, is the graph three regular or not? Okay, so this is one idea. This is what the, the DS dimension, and this is 
the fact that we can have a slight advantage here is the starting point of this whole uh, algorithm. This is idea number one. Uh, idea number two is this list learning, um, which is just a, sometimes can be a useful idea. Instead of trying to predict a single outcome, we are given x, we try to predict f of x, we can do something easier we can provide a short, we call it menu of options for x. So three options, one of them is correct. Uh, so th this is least learning and it's very natural to, in various scenarios. Um, and in our case, and I think it can be useful in general, as a way to do a first step of learning. So we first do a least learning and then move it to some other expert that does some further analysis. This also applies like for object recognition. This is 70% a cow and 20% a frog and 10% a frog. So, yeah, in, in, uh, in some specific models, the, it's very natural. It happens. It, but the list isn't ordered. There's no uh, percentages. Uh, in this model, it's not ordered. Yeah, it's less data than... Uh, So, uh, analogous to the list decoding. This yeah, this was the, the yeah, yeah. So the we the, the, we use this term because list decoding is a very basic idea in computer science. Um, okay, so this is a second idea that is uh, useful for us, and the third idea, which is most pictorial, so it's very nice. So in our setting, the size of the list will be something like the DS dimension. In our something like the DS dimension. In general, you can choose the size of the list for your application. The third idea is a very nice connection, I think, between, so here is a concept class. There are six functions. And this is, a, a, and the size of the universe is two. So this is like the function on the first coordinate, the function on the second coordinate. So there, there are six functions. And these six functions can be represented as the edges of this graph. See, this is the, fu the function one, two. <coughs> this is the function two, three. This is the function three, four. So this is a way to pictorially represent this. The green vertices are the first coordinate. The blue vertices, or whatever color this is, are the second coordinate. Okay, so we can represent these six functions in this way. This is a very simple <laughs> operation, yes? But now we took some concept class and we, here we got, a, this is a graph and it's a two colorable graph. In general, what will happen if there are more coordinates, we will get a simplicial complex here I will not, def if you want, I can define it. It's not a complicated object, but it's a generalization of a graph. And it will be colored in the same way. So we have a, a, an abstract uh, connection between concept classes and topology okay? via this simple drawing. Uh, and now it turns out that this very simple translation is extremely informative. So the Natarajan dimension being one, we saw what this means, translates to hyperbolicity of this, uh, whatever this means, of the simplicial complex. The fact that the uh, H is a pseudocube corresponds to a notion called pseudomanifold. It's, th there is this translation 
translates things from learning to things in topology. Okay? It's quite surprising in my mind that this, is, this was defined in topology. There was a, it was called a no empty square condition. It's amazing. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this was the, uh, th this, this is informative, I, and I want to uh, come again to the example. So this is an example of a class with Natarajan dimension one. There is no two-dimensional hypercube here. And DS dimension two, the degrees of all the vertices are two. So it's a gap between Natarajan and DS dimension. Very simple gap. Um, this is a picture. So these are 54 triangles. And this edge and this is edge are identified, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. So it's sort of a, it's round, sort of a toes-like thing. Uh, so this is, this corresponds to a concept class with 54 functions, whose Natarajan dimension is one, and the DS dimension is three. This is a picture of such a concept class. Um, as a comment, I would say that the next one we found has this size. So it's 6, 54, a lot. <laughs> um, okay, so n this is quite discouraging, this number. It's huge. Um, but fortunately for us, uh, these two... Uh, Apologists or uh, group theorists, I'm not sure what is the, uh, uh, proved something that says that for every D, there is this thing. Something with Natarajan dimension one and uh, DS dimension D. So they built a, a simplicial complex with this, with a nice structure like this. And the, the paper is called the hyperbolic coxeter groups of large dimension. The, the large dimension is the DS dimension. Hyperbolic means uh, Natarajan dimension one. And I wrote this, this is from their abstract. It's not very important what is, it's important, but uh, the terminology is not important what, why I wrote this. What is written here in my understanding is that uh, these things, they constructed were conjectured not to exist or to be very, very hard to find. And this is, in the topology world, maybe part of the reason that the Natarajan dimension was open, because it's very hard to build these things. Uh, and they did it. <laughs> so the, their construction is amazing. <laughs> and I, I will be very happy to discuss it, and I will be even more happy to fully understand it. <laughs> there, there is a... Um, is this English? What? <laughs> yeah. um, this is recent work? Or? This is 2003, I think. Relatively recent, I don't know. <laughs> In theory, that's called recent. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, yeah, it's an amazing construction. Uh, and the <laughs> it's when I, like, sometimes I ask uh, students to give us, to tell you how do you prove it in one word. And typically, this word is induction. This is like the, and so this is by induction. <laughs> this proof is by induction. But uh, ama really amazing. Um, so they, they solved the problem. Okay, so they showed how to do this abstractly. And so this is the second. So these are the two main things 
uh, we we find found out uh, in this uh, research and just a few ideas there is this um, the DS dimension somehow uh, allows to connect some properties of graph or hypergraphs and learnability uh, this trying to understand it better lead, led to this notion of least learning and we try maybe now to understand when can least learning be achievable it's a different question than this dimension it's a very specific loss function if you think about it abstractly uh, I didn't talk about it at all but to to understand what happens in the finite when the alphabet size is finite there is a very important idea of shifting it's a very powerful way to understand some combinatorics here and to understand shifting better we also need to introduce some dimension which we call the exponential dimension uh, and of the, the whole algorithm is uh, put into a fra framework that is easy to understand uh, in terms of learning which is called sample compression schemes so the whole construction is a construction of a sample compression scheme so this is the algorithmic part algorithmic and this part is the connection to topology and the the construction I'm sure it will have like tons of applications once we understand it it's amazing this construction um, so understand I mean truly understand um, and so you can try to go in every alley there is here um, I'll be happy to discuss any <laughs> any of these alleys um, and I thank you a lot for the attention um, thank you <laughs> yes. can you say something about what causes the, the uh, power of one and a half in the D in your is it the, the weak learning step the less step okay. yeah I, I can sure so um, just to remind maybe the question the, the number of samples the sample complexity was something like d to the 1.5 this is what we proved and I would say uh, so the algorithm has two parts there is a list part where we reduce the size of y from something we don't know to uh, l list size this is one step and the cost of this reduction um, so th there are two two options here option two natural options option one uh, is that the to get this the number of samples here is d squared this is option number one and then so this is number of samples in this step and then L is D this is option number one so we use this squared samples to get a list of size D this is option number one option number two is that we use something like D samples and we get a huge list size 2 to the square root of D this is what we get maybe th there are many other options but this is the two this is the most naive choice this is less naive but the best we could do and this leads to the in the second step of the algorithm we have a, how, how does this translate to learning so in this this is one in step number two the sample complexity is something like D times log of L this is the number of samples in the second step so this already in the first step this is D squared so this is worse this in the first step is D and in the second step is D square root D this is the, <laughs> the way it goes I'm pretty sure it's not the correct answer <laughs> 
but this is what we have. Except for the i i uh, index, all the other points must must match exactly. Mm -hmm. Or you can allow, like, for example, for the reals, you can allow like, for a small. No. Here the loss is a zero one loss, so there is no reals. There is no topology, nothing. Just like equal. Okay, yeah. and maybe can we extend somewhat to like like fetch uttering instead of like gamma. So uh, analyzing this for other loss functions, I I have no idea. And it was done. There is a lot of research about other loss functions, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not this model. It's a okay. different. Model. Thank you. Thank you.